Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Bob Mendelson, and this is the Bob's Your Uncle podcast. War in the Middle East. What is this about and can it ever be resolved? Today we consider another opinion, this from Malik Dixon, a Sydney man who grew up in the United States, lived in the Middle East, and has a lot of social science background to help us unpack this. Stay tuned. You can now find us and comment to us wherever you get your podcasts. Tell us what matters to you, what triggers your joy, what bothers you in the world. Let us know. We'll see where the spirit leads us. Wherever you are just now, whether you're out for your evening constitutional, where you're here in Australia or back in the United States with friends or all by yourself with your headset on, These episodes are going to last a little bit longer than usual. Stay with us. I think you'll enjoy or be aggravated by each one. Of note, the opinions are strictly my own and those of my guests. On this date in history, the 30th of October, Wars and Rumors of Wars. In 1961, the Soviets detonated Tsar Bomba. Somewhere in the Arctic Ocean, the largest nuclear weapon ever set off. It produced the most powerful human-made explosion ever recorded. In 1905, Emperor Nicholas II issued the October Manifesto, bringing the end of unlimited autocracy in Russia and ushering an era of constitutional monarchy. In 1340, an allied force of Castilian and Portuguese Christians defeated the Muslim Marinids of North Africa at the Battle of Rio Salado. And in 1938, Orson Welles' radio dramatization of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds was broadcast, causing great alarm, though reports of a nationwide panic were unfounded, as some listeners feared a genuine invasion from Mars. And that's the historical marker of the week. I want you to meet Malik Dixon, who is from the United States and is the fourth in our five-part series on the Middle East. He was raised in Carolina in the U.S. and uh, is black. You'll hear that straight away because much of his formation and uh, mapping is related to, I mean, he went to a black university an HBCU in the United States. Um, And his Instagram and all of his posts relate to this war and to black history as well. Well, let's get to the interview. I think that every every eye is wet, which is a term, uh, a phrase that was created by, uh, well, said by uh, Worthing, Muslims, Christians, and Jews. He said that every eye is wet, which kind of meant that everybody sees things through their particular lens. And it meant how much water you had in your eye pretty much determined what you saw and what you didn't see. And I think um, my perspective on the Middle East is um, a bit unique because I absolutely should be the last person talking about this. Just given that charity starts at home, and I'm an African-American, we got so much internal work that we should be focusing on and we should be doing. 
right in America and, you know, I'm abroad, but right in America, we got so much stuff that we should, we definitely need to be focusing on that we should be distracted by things that are happening everywhere else. But I've happened to live everywhere else. And I was a history major in college. So all of this stuff kind of is my personal interest. And I actually happened to live in the Middle East before. So I lived in the Middle East for about four years. So I got like a real, real, real on the ground take of what it's like. And I lived in the Middle East during the um, Bush administration as well. So it was very hostile towards Americans. And even though I'm African-American, so I could come up, they kind of understand abroad, they kind of understand that we don't really have anything to do with that. Um, that piece of policy and politics, they kind of, they understand that we're kind of drug into that. Um, but I definitely saw the tension towards Americans while I Great story. We've had some seriously good encounters over the years about religion and yes. also just plain fun mm -hmm. sharing with family members overlapping. What gives you your greatest pleasure these days? Mm. I think my um, role in life has changed. Um, just like your son, we both became fathers kind of late into adulthood. So that position being that my family is in America has pretty much, it pretty much shapes my day to day. Like it's really like trying, just learning um, child psychology, learning, learning how to um, balance the children and the family, being a husband and a father, the balance of that. It's actually just been a, this last couple of years has been a crash course in time management. So I knew how to manage time with school stuff, but school was all, always sort of stationary. Like you got a syllabus, you know how to plan for it. Um, but with this children thing, it's like everything's, it's always evolving. It's kind of like um, a test in time management and just your personal agility, how you can, you know, be agile with situations that really, really need you. So my kids, they um, take up a lot of my time these days. You and I have been watching with heartache the war in the Middle East with various points of stress and distress. Is there a particular news outlet that you favor that is one that seems both balanced and one that lets your views seriously be heard? I'll say this. I'll say that... Um, it's a tragedy that those people were killed, those Israelis were kidnapped, those um, Thai nationals were killed, kidnapped. The whole thing is a tragedy, man. Um, I watch all, all, all the news outlets because I, I understand how news works. I understand that news outlets have bills to pay, they have uh, offending people versus um, portraying the truth and then too much of the truth is offensive to some people because Chomsky said that selective recognition is when we choose to only see the goodness in us or um, it's basically a way of maintaining our own self um, worth and goodness so basically you would only intake things that were beneficial to what you were trying to do like for example if I work for the United States military regardless of any of the atrocities that we committed in Abu Ghraib or any failures we had in Iraq, I'm not thinking about that. Only thing I need to see for my morale and the people and my people is to see us doing good, making achievements and ac accomplishing our missions. Anything else is just something that we just rather talk about later or push that to the side and we'll deal with that in an email. Um, so with that being said, both parties, um, the the, the uh, Israeli Defense Force in Israel and Hamas only view themselves as God's sent people. So you got two groups of people. You got two groups of people who say, I'm doing the work of God. You know what I mean? So you can't tell, I, I don't have a case to say, okay, God doesn't want you to do this. I can't say that because they'll just say, okay, we don't have the same belief structure. You believe in something different. Um, so that's why I think it's very important that people who are free and absent of any, any inch, particular interest besides peace in that area and looking at what we have 
and seeing how we can maximize what we have in that particular area um, should should be involved in that peace process. I don't think any anybody that's biased on either side, I think, needs to stay out of it. Have you think this should, your own views about the Middle East over the years? I, you know what, man, I think that um, I, it's always been a problem. Like I've, I, you know, I study history, and I've lived there, and I've always watched the news. I've always read newspapers, so it's always something that's at the front of your mind. You said that people involved should not be involved in the peace process. So my next question probably is not going to be proper because if you were elected the next president of Gaza, we got rid of Hamas and the world said, we're going to put Malik on whatever they have in government. How would you solve, if you had the power, how would you solve the current Israel-Palestinian crisis? Well, I think that more than anything, from what I've seen over the last five days, if you follow a guy on on Instagram called Sean King, and um, not to be reductive to what's happened to the Israelis, um, but this is just what I, one of the things I saw. I saw Sean King is a, I think he works used to work for the Washington Post in America, but his don't go to his Instagram. It's very it's like super confronting. He's got all the videos from like everything. So I just had to block Sean King or put him on restrict him because I, I just couldn't see any more of that. So um, just they're, they're going to need therapy. The people of Gaza, the ones that are still around and have are there now, they're going to need therapy. I I don't cry about anything. Like I'm like, I maybe I cried when my daughter was born. I cried when I saw an interview of September 11th. I cried when my grandmother died. The other day I saw one video of like this guy in Gaza having to identify his son. They were, they found all the other kids, but then when he was looking for his son, they said somebody go check the morgue. And when they checked the morgue, he couldn't even go near the body. I was just like, wow, that my tear ducts just malfunction. And once they get therapy, once we get all that together, and I'm pretty sure Israelis would need therapy, and they're probably going through what they need to go through now because as you know i'm a social scientist so i know that my jewish friends have had a heavy hand in psychology and sociology psychiatry so i'm pretty sure they are well taken care of but these palestinians are going to need therapy and then second thing they're going to need is they're going to need to build an infrastructure that would be a combination of first thing we need to do to survive and thrive is we need to assure that Israel feels safe. They gotta feel safe. And I'm used to do, being that person because as a large African-American in my encounters with Caucasian Americans, I had to always make sure they felt safe before we started. And once they feel safe, and it's not, it's not like me going out of my way, pandering or anything like that. I just need to let you know, this is who I am, this is what I do. I look like, uh, I look like this and I'm sound like this, but I'm actually this. Um, and part of that fear comes from not knowing. So a lot of the white guys that I've met in America, cause I come from the segregated South, they've never really had personal relationships with black people. You know what I mean? So making sure they're safe and then coming up with a program around the infrastructure, the economy, and then leaning on people that are gonna help that happen. Like, if you ensure that Israel is going to be safe, but at the same time, Palestinians need to feel safe as well. They need to say, this part of Palestine is not up for grabs for new settlers. This is, it, it needs to, those boundaries need to be established. And then you take countries like, that have minimal resources, but maximize everything they have. Like Singapore, you look at somewhere like the United Arab Emirates, you take Gaza and you say, we're going to mentor Gaza and build Gaza up to this. And we got a plan for Gaza. We see in Arabic, they got a, a particular word for politics called Hizbiya. So in Hizbiya is just po po political game. So because there was a, a lack of um, structure in a lot of Arab societies, 
um, a lot of things happened to Arab societies. Like socialism came in, communism came in, Arab nationalism came in. The only places where that stuff didn't have a footing is places that they had a hard control over. Like you look at places like Libya. When Libya was Libya, they didn't have that problem. When Iraq was the Iraq, they didn't have that problem because democracy, as well as it works, a popular democracy is is is, is um we praise democracy, right? We think democracy is great, um, and it, it is good. Um, but if you do a popular democracy now, and you were to say in North Carolina, um, should African Americans go back to slavery, and it was a, left to a popular democracy. I would hate to see the results. I would hate to see the results because a vote without education is just a, a popularity contest. You know what I mean? So that's exactly what you'll get when you have democracies that don't don't th don't run by in having informed voters. Malik, you're a you're a father of two really beautiful daughters. Thank you. Do you have any worries about the world in which they're growing? That is, is the world worse today than when you were a kid? To answer that question, the world that I grew up in and the world that my kids are growing up in are two different things. I came up during the 1990s, um, which was the crack era. And I grew up in a city that um, had a lot of issues with crack. And I grew up in the middle of the city. So I saw a lot of things that my daughters would never see. Just by being in Australia, the world that they're in is just completely sheltered, completely loving, trauma-free. Um, they don't have to worry about, at the moment, a police brutality. They don't have to worry about, uh, they don't have to worry about just getting shot at Walmart. They don't have to worry about, so all of the American stuff is off the plate, right? Um, the issues that they do have to worry about are being accepted by their peers, um, being a little bit different from a lot of their peers, figuring out what to do after high school because it's not as streamlined as as it is in America where you, you know, you either go to college, you go to the army, or you start some kind of work. Whereas Australia, you know, it's, it's a little bit different. So I'm trying to figure out how what the end of year 12 looks like. I'm 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 safe to say the, the world is changing, but for women, I think the world is changing in a way that's better for women. I think people are recognizing that we can't be savages. We got to really be cognizant of how we treat women. We got to be conscious of what we say to women. And I think it's a better time. Do you have hope for peace in the Middle East? Yeah, I think I, I reject, like I'm, I reject a lot of stuff that people think is God's will. I think that man does things that God allows them to do, but would rather them not do based on the information that he's given them before. So when you make a decision, you don't make a decision like the rest of the animal species. You make a decision based on the information that you have, and then you deal with the consequences that come with it. So I reject all of the things that says that God told me to go down here and destroy this. God told me to put this bomb on me and do this. I don't think God wants that for you. I think God wants to see you in this life benefit from the things that he's giving you. So with that being said, I think, yeah, I think that I'm hopeful for peace. I think that both parties need to sit their egos to the side. They need to be really honest with each other about where we are and what we can do with what we can do. And I think that any politician or anybody over the age of 45 needs to just get out of the whole Middle East thing. Because you bring in the views that got us here. You had 50 years to get it right. Like when I think about Netanyahu, he's made so many mistakes. The Israeli people want his ass out of there. So he's, yeah, he he it's kind of like uh, Joe Biden. I feel like you respect your elders, but I think this is a young man's world. I think that the young people got more information and they figuring stuff out faster than we are. We're just holding on to our father's enemies and we're just fighting our father's wars instead of saying, okay, let's get this right. This Middle East shit been going on too long. Let's clean it up. It's, I mean, it's gotta be a better way. 
I think that we we got to learn how. The biggest struggle to get to anybody's heaven or get closer to Hisham, Allah, God, Jehovah, Yahweh, is to learn how to live with each other. To different tribes, to say, we're going to live with each other and we're not going to slaughter each other. We're going to figure this out. We're going to share the resources. You know what I mean? And that's just, it's just, we got to evolve from the Iceman inheritance. When we came out of caves and we didn't know how everybody was a threat because they were a threat to our resources. We didn't, we didn't have uh, agricultural society where we can just grow food and it was renewable. So any food or any resource, I had to kill you for it. We got to, I mean, we come a long way. Molly, oh it's a joy to talk to you. I really appreciate Thanks. your your forthright thoughts. Like, I feel like I'm not a Palestinian or a Jew. So I, you know, I can't speak for any of the groups, but I can tell you that the world is tired of this. I mean, come on. The world, is, I mean, it's got to be a better way. Anyway, Malik, I got to go. Thank you for your Same, time. man. Thank you as well, man. Let me know how it all goes. And if I you will. need anything else from me, brother, I got you back. You're beautiful. All the best Peace. to you. You Thanks. too, man. Peace. think about all this why don't you write me bob mendo at aol.com or comment on an instagram or tiktok to me i'd love to know what you're thinking every week we read from a portion of the bestseller, the number one bestseller of all time, the Bible, and today's no different. From the Gospel of John, the words of Yeshua himself, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Don't let your heart be troubled, don't let it be afraid. Thanks for being with me today. Now we've been announcing that this is a five-part series and we had Miranda Weiss who fought in the IDF. We had Abu Saleh um, who also, uh, everybody <laughs> is an Australian um, that I've had on these this five-part series. Um, we had Paul Cohen and today we had Malik. And tomorrow I'm gonna sum up what is it that Bob thinks about this crisis? What is it that's going to bring hope to my kids and grandkids? What's going to bring hope to the world? Is there a solution to it all? Come back tomorrow. Let's have a final word on this. And when things seem bleak or uncertain, look up to God. He's in his heaven. And Bob's your uncle. <laughs>